Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography Department at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to welcome distinguished photographer Stephen Shames as tonight's guest speaker. <laughs> Stephen creates photo essays on social issues for foundations, advocacy organizations, the media, and museums. He is represented by Stephen Kasher Gallery and by Polaris Images. Stephen is the author of eight monographs, Bronx Boys, University of Texas Press, Outside the Dream, Pursuing the Dream, The Black Panthers, All by Aperture, Bronx Boys ebook, Photo Evidence, Facing Race, Moravian College, Transforming Lives, Starbright Books, and Free to Grow, Columbia University. His upcoming ninth monograph will be published by Abrams in the fall of, 2000, of 2016. It is an updated Black Panther photo and oral history, co-author with Bobby Seal. Stephen was named a Purpose Prize Fellow in 2010 for his work with AIDS orphans and former child soldiers. He received the Kodak Crystal Eagle Award for Impact in Photojournalism for his book, Outside the Dream. Um, if you've ever wondered what it means to pursue a documentary project for 20 plus years, tonight is the, the chance to find out. So please help me welcome Stephen Shames to our lecture series. Well, thank you, everyone, for, for showing up. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to um, show a bunch of pictures from a number of projects. And, and really, um, what I do is long, long, long-term projects. Um, the shortest, you know, I've, I've done assignments and, and regular things for magazines like everybody else. But most of my projects, I think the least amount of time I ever spent on a long-term project was maybe six months. And the longest, which Bronx Boys spanned two decades, was over 20 years. Um, and I think that's, that's really important. If you're going to do a long-term photo essay, you really need to take time. Because it, it really takes a long time to really get involved in a, in a community, to get involved in people's lives, and to watch, you know, watch people change over time. And you can't really do that in two or three days or, or, or a week. Because you don't, you know, sometimes, especially if it's more foreign um, to you, if it's in a foreign country or it's a culture you really, you know, that isn't your own culture, um, it can take, you know, three or four weeks or even longer to really figure out what's going on. So the first thing that's really important is to take a, a, take a long time. The second thing is research. When I do a project, I really research it. I read. Um, if I'm going into a, a, a different country or a different culture that isn't my own, I'll, uh, I, I don't just read journalistic things. I read novels. I listen to music. I'll read poetry. I'll watch movies. For instance, if I was going to go to India, I would want to listen to Indian music. I would even go to Indian restaurants. And just anything that kind of gets you into the, into the mood, it gets you feeling close to, to, to what's going on. The idea is to try and understand and look through it through their eyes, to get out of your own culture. You know, all of us live in a little bubble of culture, right? And most people aren't able to see beyond that. And that, so people judge, and that actually causes a lot of the problems in the world. I mean, a lot of the things America does in the world is because we have a certain set of values, and we'll go over to the Middle East and say, well, everyone should be doing this. And they're going like, are you crazy? We don't want to do that. We want to do this. And so we don't get it. And, I, and I'm not judging whether they're right or we're, we're right. Sometimes we're right and sometimes they're right. But that isn't the point. The point is that you have to try and get outside of your bubble, of your culture, and the blinders that you have and the things that you've grown up with, uh, the social values, the religious values, the other values. It isn't to say that your values are bad. It's just to say if you're going to be a good journalist and a good photographer and you're walking into someone else's place, you got to leave this behind and try and get into their bubble and try and understand it. And if you can do that, you'll take better pictures. So that's the second thing. And, and so research is really, really, really important. When I did the Outside the Dream, 
project. I mean, I researched it for months. I, I sit down and I'll, I'll make outlines of what I'm going to do. And frankly, when I get out and shoot, I throw the outlines away because I don't want to be rigid. I want to just see what I see. But I make these outlines, OK? I'm doing child poverty in America. OK, what are the components? Well, homelessness is one component. So where are there more homeless people? Well, it turns out there's more homeless people in Los Angeles area than any place else in the country. So boom, that's where I went to do that component. Then once I got there, you do more research. You talk to people. The, the second thing that's really important is to find a guide. In foreign countries, they call them fixers, but it, I call them guides. Y to find somebody who can take you around. Some cases protect you, in some, if it's dangerous, and in some, but in other cases, just to introduce you to people. The guide can be, for instance, a social service person. When I went out to do homeless, I hooked up with Catholic social services, Lutheran home, or social services, um, you know, and they would take me around and introduce me to their clients. I, you know, one of the ways I, I, I met homeless people was to go to food shelters, you know, where people were going to get food. And then you'd just sit and you'd have a meal and you talk to people. Well, can I document your family? And some people said yes, some people said no. But the guide gets you in there. Um, the third thing, and then I really will start showing you some pictures. The third thing is to just be there, to embed yourself, to just listen and observe and just spend time. And that's where the time comes in, to just a lot of photography is like fishing. You know, it's just sitting there and sitting there and sitting there and sitting there and then boom, there's a picture. You know, and um, when you're doing documentary photography, you don't know when that moment's going to be. So I'm going to actually start with the first project I ever did. And I, I like this picture because to me it's kind of the picture of America. I mean, America's still run by a bunch of dead white people. And so... This picture, that's oh, a joke. Anyway, um, <laughs> nothing, one of the things that's really disconcerting, next year, besides being the 50th anniversary of the Black Panther Party, which was the first project I did, I was a photographer for the Black Panther Party because of the relationship I um, made with Bobby Seale, who was like a father figure. Bobby Seale was the chairman of the Black Panther Party and one of the two founders. He and Huey Newton founded the, the party. And I started when I was a student at Berkeley. So I was actually 20 years old. I was actually the age of, of maybe even younger than, than, than some of you. And I had been a photographer for, when I took my first picture of the Panthers, I think I'd been a photographer three or four months. I just picked up a camera. I was really learning. And I learned fast, I guess. I had to learn fast because a lot of stuff was going on. Um, and one of the things that, you know, the Panthers, um, you know, were a political movement. One of the things that I was going to say that's disconcerting is that of the issues, all the issues that the Panthers formed themselves around, which were police brutality, housing, economics, um, um, racial issues, um, education, um, the justice system, um, the only one that's really changed at all is, is that there are now more black and minority officials, including the President of the United States. Back in 1968, Bobby Seale told me there were 50 black elected officials on all levels, from the school board to the U.S. Senate and the whole country. And now there are thousands. Um, so that's one area that's changed. Education has changed a little bit in the sense that there are now black studies departments in university. Actually at Berkeley, when I was a student at Berkeley and at San Francisco State, were actually the first two strikes to establish the first black um, and ethnic studies department in the United States. And we actually had a strike for a whole year at Berkeley. The campus was shut down. The police came in and beat everybody up. And it was like really, really. Um, violent. Anyway, the Panthers really taught me, um, you know, got me into the, into the community. And I'm, I'm starting this off showing you, these are kind of, these first few images 
are kind of the images you've probably seen. That's Bobby Seale, who is a really charismatic speaker. These images are kind of the media images of the Panthers. And what you're going to see is Kathleen Cleaver, one of the, one of the leaders. These are uh, free Huey rallies. But what you're going to see as we move along is that a different image of the Panthers than what the media portray. Because I really spent seven years with the Panthers, ending in Bobby Seale's um, election campaign. That's Eldridge Cleaver. As you can see, I was really like there. I could be right um, um, next to them. And getting, getting access is really, really important. And you've got to kind of um, sometimes think on your feet to get access. Um, for example, I'll tell you, I don't have a picture of it, but I, Martin Luther King came to speak at Berkeley. And um, there was like a giant crowd, and I didn't have a press pass. I was a student. I was like a sophomore or junior. At any rate, I'm in the men's room before the speech. And I just over the side, you know, you guys who are in the men's room, you don't really look, but you, you have peripheral vision. And who's next to me but Martin Luther King? So I'm like, wow, this is Martin Luther King. So, uh, you know, we both finish. We're washing our hands, and he starts talking to me. And suddenly it dawns on me, you know, we had a conversation. We're walking. I thought, you know, if I keep talking to him, I'm going to be able to get right up to the speaker's platform. So we were just talking. Of course, he's walking, and the crowd's parting for him, and I'm talking to him. So no one's saying, do you have a problem? You know, who are you? We've been waiting here two hours to hear this guy speak. I'm not letting you come in. I mean, I'm talking to Martin Luther King. They figured I'm a friend of his. And we walk all the way out, and I sat at his feet. So you really, you know, the idea is to think on your feet and, and really, you know, get, get access. Now, what happened with the Panthers is that Bobby Seale liked me. We formed a relationship, and they were very media conscious, and they wanted pictures. And so I was working for the underground press, also the Associated Press, that's kind of how I paid my way through school. I mean, it was just constant turmoil. And I was just selling pictures to AP and then later Newsweek, New York Times, I, you know, Washington Post. I was stringer for all those papers because of all the demonstrations and stuff that was going on. This is Huey Newton, by the way. Um, now I talked about the part of the Panthers you don't really see. You know, the first pictures are the images. And that picture of the Panthers on parade is my most widely published Panther picture. I mean, that's the picture everybody um, wants. That's actually even at the Smithsonian. They just bought that picture in a permanent exhibit in the African American Museum. But this is also the Panthers, um, the breakfast program. And really, I mean, look at the intensity. Look at the kids. Look at what's, what's going on. This is the part that people don't realize. The Panthers had like a 95% positive rating in the black community. And although J. Edgar Hoover and, and the FBI and the Nixon administration you know, assassinated them and, and did all, you know, said all kinds of lies, they actually were feeding it. I think at the end it was like 10 or 20,000 kids, and not just black kids, as you can see um, from the pictures. Anyone who needed to be fed, they fed them. Um, they, then they had a food program where they'd give away, you know, bags of food, and they used that for um, voter registration. They had a clothing program, um, medical program, sickle cell anemia. Um, the Panthers were, you know, nobody was testing for sickle cell anemia before the Panthers. The Panthers really popularized that disease, which, why? why? That affects the black community. You know, so the medical establishment wasn't that interested. And we know that when AIDS came in, we had the same issue. The medical establishment didn't deal with AIDS until some actors got it. You know, it took a, you know, it just, in America, sometimes you have to blast your way into consciousness. Um, and the Panthers were able to do that. These are the Panther kids. They set up a school. And this school became a charter school. One of the first charter schools actually got an award from the California State Legislature. It was such a good, um, a good school. Now, I mentioned trying to get beneath. How many of you, you know, this is a rhetorical question. You don't need to answer. But how often do you see an image like that of black males in the media? Can anyone actually remember a picture from the last two years that's seen any place in the media of a nurturing black male? Sun Lee's father's project. 
Yeah, no, people do it. Photographers do it, but I'm, I'm talking about the mass media. I know people do it. Um, but, you know, what do you see? You see drug dealers, you see, you know, rappers, you see all kinds of things. The media doesn't, doesn't show this. And, and, and so to me, it's very important when I'm photographing in a community to really show the things that aren't, aren't shown. Also, women in the Panthers. The, major the average age of the Panthers was 19 years. And the majority of the Panthers were women. People don't realize that. Political education class, anyway. Um, and again, something like this. This is a Panther out in the community, just you know, talking to people. Now, I was able to get this because I just embedded myself. I was with them. I, I went to 10 different cities. Um, I actually was supposed to do a book in 1970. Huey Newton was the author, and he was going to do a book with me. And Spiro Agnew was vice president under Nixon. I know I'm talking about things most of you guys before most of you people were born. But uh, anyway, Spiro Agnew golfed with the chairman of the publishing company, and he said, we don't want this book to come out. How did they even know that there was a book? They were spying, right? They, they, anyway, the editor got fired. The editor who signed the book. I had a letter of intent, and they just, they just refused to do the book. Um, that's, you know, that was when Nixon was riding high before he was impeached. Um, there's Huey and Bobby, the two founders of the party. And then this sort of thing. I mean, these aren't great photos as photos, but they're really nice. It shows a different side of, of Huey and Bobby. They really were funny. They joked around with each other. You don't see stuff like this you know, in, in the media that often. So it's Erica Huggins. That's David Hilliard, um, you know, with his, with his wife. Um, this is George Jackson, who was, um, who was killed. And this is the funeral for George Jackson. This is inside the Panther office. Again, something that, you know, I had access too. I, I guess I was crazy then. There was a rumor the Panthers were going to, the police were going to raid the office, and I actually spent, they didn't raid it, I, which I'm glad of, because I spent the night in the office. I, I was crazy. I thought I was going to get a picture of the police coming in. And then 10 years later, when I was thinking about it, I said, are you insane? You would have gotten shot. But luckily, they didn't, they didn't come in. Um, it's Bobby Seale, rallies. And then Bobby Seale ran for mayor, and I was on his campaign team, and I was with him every, every day when he was campaigning. Um, he actually uh, came in second and paved the way for um, um, Lionel Wilson, became mayor four years later, and Ron Dellums, who uh, became chairman of the Armed Services Committee in the 90s, became congressman from that district. And he was very, very close to the Panthers. Now, this project, um, I started in 1984, um, Outside the Dream, Child Poverty in America, uh, became a book published by Aperture. And this, this I did a lot of research. I read, read through all these very, very boring um, government statistics and um, you know, books that the government puts out. Uh, you know, how many kids are poor and who's eating and who's not eating and all these things that they put out that they don't really act on, but they put them out. And so I um, applied for and got a grant, Alicia Patterson Foundation grant, and I bought a car and I started out in California and just spent the whole year driving across the country really living. Um, so I had some grant money, but then I lived with people I was photographing. Um, for two reasons. One is that saved me a lot of money. I mean, I would buy food, you know, so I kind of helped the people I was living with by, um, you know, buying, buying food because I had to eat, but I'd always, you know, buy, buy food. But then people felt good about that. And then, um, but also because that's the way to really get close. Um, you know, things don't happen nine to five. So if you're photographing families, especially families that are under stress, Something may happen at 6 in the morning or 3 at night. And if you're not there, you know, and, and if you leave and come back at 9, it takes time to get, you know, people used to you again. So I just found the best thing is to just, just move in with people. And you just have to, you know, people are willing to, to do that and to let you move in. I think the thing is if they feel that you're honest um, and that you're doing an honest portrayal of them, 
and you're not looking down at them and making fun of them. Um, and I also tell people, look, I, I'm going to be here. If, you, if it gets to be too much or you don't want me to photograph something, just, just tell me and I, I'll leave. Because, you know, people, you know what I'm saying? You have to leave people some, some dignity. You can't just be trying to grab, you know, I, I call it the photographers who are kind of hiding behind trees with telephotos trying to, you know, that, you know what I mean, those kind of photographers. No, if you're staying with people and you're taking pictures, you know, you're in their living room, um, you have to give them the option to say, you know what, it's a little too much. You know, 99% of the time, nobody ever says anything. But once in a while, somebody does. And you have to respect that. You're in their, you know, you're in their world. Um, this, this picture was out in California. And, you know, I, I, got, I bought a tent. I had the car, and I bought a tent, and I went and camped with the people. There were all these people living out on the beach in a state park. Um, and some of them were in campers, and some were in tents, and this was a family, the two teenage boys slept in the car. So I just told them, you know, just leave the, the car unlocked, and I'm going to come by in, 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 in the morning. I just, you know, I told them I was coming by in the morning before they woke up so that I wouldn't scare them. And they left the door unlocked, and I opened the door and, and took that picture, which to me just became kind of an iconic picture of... Uh, yeah. Of, of a, um, this was in Cincinnati. Again, you know, when you structure the things, I structured the poverty book around kids' lives. Um, play, school, family. Um, the big issues haven't changed since prehistoric times, you know. Um, nothing's really, really changed. I mean, family, you know, that people had tribes when they were cavemen, and, and we still have tribes. You know, we, maybe we call them ethnic groups or whatever, but people are, are still tribal. You know, and in fact, getting out of our, you know, in fact, America right now, the biggest issue in, in the presidential debate is immigration. But what that's really about is tribalism, isn't it? There are, there are white tribes who, who came here and took this continent away from the Indians, and now we don't want the other, you know, some of us don't want the other people to come here. And when, we, when our ancestors came here from Eastern Europe, the people who were here before, they didn't like us. And, but it's really, if you look at it, it's really tribal. That's the big issue that's in Europe and the United States right now. But if you go back to you know, caveman times, what, were they, what was the issue? It was tribalism, which makes people feel safe. But also, you know, in this day and age, we had to get beyond it. So. You know, people, you know, so this was, uh, you know, some southern whites and, and poor whites in Cincinnati. And obviously poor kids, a lot of poor kids, especially poor kids whose parents are working, are unsupervised. So they, you know, do a lot of stupid things like smoke. So um, the kid told me the gun was unloaded, but he took it to school to protect himself. He said he took it to school to protect himself from the gangs, but actually... If you can see the way they're dressed, I mean, I never argue with people when they tell you what they're doing. You're a journalist, you just listen to people. But that kid on the right, it's, he's dressed, he's a, he was in a gang, even though he told me he wasn't. It was obvious, you know, that's how the gang members in Los Angeles dress with the shirt like that. Um, but they, you know, these kids were nice kids, and their parents, this is a little story I actually did it for, as part of the project, I did it for Stern Magazine. I was there with a reporter. And their parents, it was so American, their, both their parents worked at Disneyland as domestics, and both their parents were undocumented, but the kids were born here, so the kids were American citizens. And I just thought, well, great, they're working at Disneyland, you know, Fantasyland, all, all America, Disneyland, and here are the kids, and they're, you know, the parents came here to make a better life, but unfortunately the kids weren't necessarily going to have a better life here because they got sucked into the, the, you know, the gangs and, and because of the neighborhood. So that became you know, that, that, that story. Um, family violence was another thing I documented. And here was a family. I mean, these, these two fought for like three hours. And again, it, it's good to have a focus. My focus is always on the children. How does this affect the children? I actually, sometimes I keep in touch. That, that little girl actually called me 
um, like 20 years, 20, 25 years later, she became a social worker and she was working in Boston and she called me up. And her mom, I think her dad, at, I'm trying to remember the story. I'm, I'm getting old. I'm going to be 70 pretty soon. And um, so my mind is going. But anyway, I think, I, I know her mother died, and I think her dad at some point killed her mom, you know, later. Um, they got apart and we got back together, and she didn't have a picture of her mom, so she tracked me down, called me, and she wanted, I didn't send her this picture, but I had some nice pictures of her mom, so I sent her some pictures of, of her mom. And one of the things, when you spend a lot of time with people, sometimes, you know, I mean, they'll, they'll call you later, or you, you know, you can keep contact with them. But anyway, um, teenage pregnancy, again, violence. You'll see there's a lot of violence in, in, in the things that I document. Um, drugs. And again, it's not what you, what you always think. I mean, here, this little kid, you know, they're doing the drugs, and this 11-year-old little kid is just sitting there. You know, when you look at TV, there's this whole other image of drug dealers. You know, they always have their guns out and this and that, but it isn't like that. Um, I asked the boy on the left why he helped his friend shoot up. And he said, you know, he's going to do it anyway. And at least if I do it for him, he's not going to die. You know, I can make sure that, you know, he doesn't o OD. And... Um, that, that was what he felt. And actually, we were talking earlier, Jaime and I talking earlier, there's a picture I have of a, a kid jumping between two buildings. He asked me about it. One of the things you learn when you're, you're doing things is to have a little um, humility. Um, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions is an expression. And, and um, again, as we see in American foreign policy, America always has good intentions and we intervene all over the world and that often turns out more, more often than... Half the time, it turns out really badly and not what we think it's going to be. And, and that's the same with pictures. I mean, you know, if you're going to be a photographer, you've got to realize that your pictures have to do the talking. And if you want to save kids, maybe you should try being a social worker. Not that social workers always are that successful. But if you're going to be a photographer, you've got to realize that what you're doing is that your pictures are going to talk to thousands, if not millions, of people, and that maybe through your pictures you can get people to act. And that sometimes happens. Sometimes it doesn't, but often it, often it does. I could have talked to this kid and maybe got him not to shoot up for a couple of days, but who knows? You know, two days later he probably would have would have done it again. And meanwhile, I wouldn't have had the picture to show people. So. I think, you know, if you're going to do these sort of topics, you've just got to realize that there's a lot of stuff going on in the world. It's been going on before you were born. It's going to go on after all of us are dead. And it's going to continue. If you read history in the 1400s, the same things were happening. In 500 BC, the same things were happening. In the year 3000, the same things are going to be happening. And that's Unfortunately, that's life. Things get a little better, and then they get worse, and that's just the way things are. Um, I did a, you know, part of the project was to look at kids getting locked up, kids in jail, um, you know, the conditions. Housing, this is one of the housing, the infamous housing projects in Chicago. I think this one's gotten torn down since. Um, This was actually, and sometimes you just take a picture that's just nice light, and I don't know what it means, but this was a family living in Brooklyn in one of the homeless um, hotels. I, 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 in the, uh, um, you know, when was it? In the 80s, in the mid-80s, um, um, there were all these homeless hotels in New York and Times Square in Brooklyn that the city was paying like $3,000 a month to hotel owners to house homeless people. Um, complete waste of money. They should have given the money to people and let them buy a house. You know, they're spending $36,000 a year. They could have bought a nice house someplace for the homeless family, but we didn't, you know, we just enriched a bunch of slum landlords. This was along the uh, border 
in the uh, um, U.S. and Mexico on the U.S. side, families living without water. Again, some of the poorest um, neighbor besides the Bronx, a couple of places in the Bronx which are the poorest, Mississippi and right along the Texas-Mexican uh, border are the poorest areas in the, in the United States. This is again in the hotel. As I said, I'm always trying to show what people don't see. This kid just looked after his little sister in this, in this uh, homeless hotel. I did a project, this was like a, I think uh, I did this over a couple of years, but I spent five months total riding with the police, um, really on, on homicide, youth violence at a time when in the 90s when there was a spike in the homicide rate, and I really wanted to do a story on that. Um, this was in New York, coming up from Times Square, um, but that picture is, um, is, is in Houston, and that's a Houston um, police detective on the right, and I, I rode with them. I had a beeper. Um, we didn't have cell phones back then, but I had a beeper, and I rode with the police all day, and then at night, if there was um, you know, a homicide, they would beat me, and I would meet them. And then I spent some time riding with the ambulances. I mean, you got to get clearances. I got clearance from the main hospital um, that I could just go in and out. You know, I went and talked to the PR people and told them ahead of time. I did it for Texas Monthly, so that really helped because that's a big magazine in Texas and everyone knew them and that gave us credibility. And the, so the police gave me permission to ride with them and the ambulance, which was the fire department, and then the main Ben Taub Hospital. So, I could just walk, walk in and uh, walk in and out. Um, there was at a funeral. Again, talk to people. So I went there early. I, the night before, I went to the family and I explained what I wanted to do and the project that I was doing and could I come to the funeral and they agreed. And I explained to them that, you know, you know, would might be necessary to, to you know, to take pictures like this to get in the other you know, side. And, and they agreed. They, they understood. And then I went th the morning before. I went a couple hours early, and I talked to the pastor of the church. You know, you can't just show up. Um, you have to really cover your bases. And, and, and the reason I went the night before is obviously the family. I wasn't going to bother the family during the day, but I went the night before and paid my respects and sat down and had a talk with them. And, and really, you know, ask their permission. I mean, you can't just walk into somebody's funeral. But they understood that it was really important, you know, to let people know that all these kids were getting shot. And, and pe you know, people will, if people understand what you're doing and you explain what you're doing, most people will, will agree. Because, you know, even families that are really upset because their child's dead, it's like, well, I don't want my kid at least he won't have died in vain. Maybe we're going to save some other kid or whatever. You know, it, but it's, you don't need to overplay it. You just need to be honest. Look, I'm trying to just let people know what's going on, and, and I need to take some pictures, and I understand maybe you know, it's, it's not going to be pleasant. But also, since the family and the pastor knew, when I showed up, some of the people in the congregation got, started to get really angry at me because I got behind and took the picture, and the family and the pastor just went over to him and told him to shut up. You know, so, you know, and then the people shut up because they, oh, you gave him permission, well, that's okay then. Um, again, you know, I got the call, I went in, this, this um, you know, kid got, was an innocent bystander, but he just got hit with a shotgun blast that was meant for the person who was standing next to him. And he came in, and sometimes you have this, these, 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 these moments, you know, you're taking pictures, but you also got to talk to people. So at one point, you know, the emergency room's like crazy. They're all in there dealing with them. They stabilize them. Everybody leaves, and this kid's just sitting there, and I'm there with them. And he turns to me, and he, he grabs my hand. He's holding my hand, and he says, am I going to die? And I said, No. I mean, I didn't know, but what, what are you going to say? I mean, I, I didn't know if he was going to die or not, but, you know, you know you, whatever. I said, no, you're not going to die. Everything's going to be okay. And we stood there, and he talked to me. And I went by and visited him the next day. And, and again, when I walked in, his family, some of his uncles, you know, they saw my cameras, and they were like, 
I won't repeat the language they used, but they were kind of angry. And the kid went, no, no, he's okay. And then so I went and talked to the family. So it's really important to establish rapport with people because, you know, you're in all these situations. And, and if you've established rapport with the main people, then they'll talk to the other people who might not understand what you're doing. This is a policeman. Again, you know, he didn't want to be next to her. It's just kind of relationships. Then after Outside the Dream, I had this idea which became a project that I did for the Ford Foundation um, on solutions. So it's basically community solutions to children in poverty. This was the biggest project I ever did. It had a budget of $400,000. I mean, we raised, uh, it was really amazing. I went, I, I, I got the Kodak Crystal Eagle Award, which he, talked about. So I was down at National Geographic for the ceremony. And there was someone from the Ford Foundation there who came up to me after the talk. And they said, oh, what are you working on now? I said, I said well, I'm thinking of doing this project on solutions. And the guy went, you know, he's a program officer there. He said, oh, wow, we've just been talking about that. And I said, really? He said, yeah, why don't you come by and talk to us about it? So that started a year of conversations with them. And I mean, my end, the, the, the proposal that I finally put in to get this giant grant was like 80 pages. I mean, I had to rewrite it like 10 times, and it had a lot of documentation. I worked with a community organization, Family, Re family um, Resource Coalition, it was called back then. It became Family Support America. I work with them um, to write the proposal. So it's really important to find partners and to find people who can help you. And if you're going to do a project like this, I learned that from Ken Light, who's a wonderful photographer. I don't know if you, you know Ken. But anyway, he's a professor now at, at UC Berkeley, the Graduate School of Journalism. But he's done a, a ton of books. And he always, he's the one who taught me that you want to do a project on social issues, find an organization who wants to document that issue and work with them and let them use your pictures and, and let them, you know, they'll, they'll help you with the research, put in a grant together. The grant I put in for the Ford Foundation wasn't a photography grant. It was actually a poverty grant. I mean, they were actually doing it to do a campaign. Um, and, and actually, they, we had some success. They actually, there was another grant. They actually, uh, after the book and the exhibit, they actually put together a program, another foundation, put together a program, a $10 million program in 10 states to improve services to children and families. And they used the pictures as a way to illustrate something to policymakers that was very boring. I mean, how do you talk to people about improving services to family? I don't know if you've ever read any of these reports that people do on social services, you know, government reports. I mean, if, you, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, get one of those reports and read it. I mean, they'll put you to sleep. So the pictures can, can make it interesting. Um, anyway, so I, we, you know, we went back and forth and back and forth. And, and finally, the defining moment is I came in with a grant proposal um, for $100,000 to Ford. And, and the, uh, Bob Curvin, who was the um, project officer, uh, said to me, you know, I don't know that we can fund that. And my heart dropped. He said, you know, we need to make sure that you can actually finish the project. I mean, if we give you this money, how are you going to get money to finish the project? So I started, I was like, oh, God, he's rejecting me. And then I said, wait, what's he really saying? So I turned to him, I said, what you're really saying to me is I'm not asking for enough money? He said, yeah. I said, I can live with that. <laughs> so I went back and gave him a grant for $400,000, and they approved it. So that, that was the luckiest thing in my life. This was a program, Friends of the Children, which actually targeted in kindergarten the, the most abused and neglected children in Portland, Oregon. And then they stayed with them through high school. They gave them an uncle or aunt who they called a friend. Really the idea of an extended family, what used to be in America 100 years ago, but doesn't really exist so much anymore. 
uh, were people who had aunts and uncles who kept them in line and really mentored them and helped them. And so they give the, these kids, and they, I mean, these are the kids who's, who, you know, social services would run in at three in the morning and take them out of the family. And they really sat with them. And that first kid, um, this one ended up going to college. But when we first, uh, he was a tough little kid. When I met him, his mentor, Zach, was an incredible guy. But when I met this kid, he was in second grade. Had the, uh, He was so tough, and his dad was in prison, and his mom was on welfare, and he was hanging out with the drug dealers, you know, in second grade. And Zach actually went to the drug dealers and told them, you know, when this kid comes, send him home. And they did, because they respected Zach, and they also... Again, people have this image of drug dealers, but they're just people who live in the community, and they realize that this kid had a chance, and so that they, they, they left him alone. Um, this was a program, you know, where they hired kids to, to gave them money to paint over um, graffiti. The Girls, Inc., um, which is, um, um, helped girls in, in math and, and science as a way of, of you know, it was as a way of, of helping them, but also an, an approach to keeping girls from getting pregnant and getting in trouble, really helping them do really well in school. This is a school in San Diego where they had all these parents from uh, Ethiopia, Somalia, um, you know, Korea, China, all, all over the place. They, they had, I think, um, you know, 20, it's like some of the schools in Queens. They just had uh, parents speaking 20 or 30 languages. Um, Lastly, I, we're almost running out of time, but I'll go through this fast. We did Bronx Boys. I spent 20 years on Bronx Boys. That kid in the white shirt is Martin, and he wrote the text for the book. Um, this book has a lot of text. I mean, the text is like 30 or 40 pages in the book, and it's really his story. Growing up, uh, his mom was addicted to crack. He didn't know his dad. Um, he was out in the street. He's now, he's become a success story. He's now a vice president. He's actually a regional president of a, of a national food company, you know, making uh, six figures, a bonus. He's, he's, he's about to, to buy a big house down in Florida. Um, his kids are going to college. A really an incredible, um, in, incredible um, young man, and he tells his story in the book. Uh, and that's really important. You know, I, I really wanted this book not just to be my um, view of the Bronx, but I really wanted, you know, someone from the Bronx, and actually Pancho, who's, I'll, I'll show you his picture in a minute too, um, wrote a little um, text in the book too. But I really wanted their voice to be, um, to be, to be in, the, in the book. And sometimes in this case, they didn't actually help me lay out the book, but they actually looked at the pictures and commented on the pictures and had some say in what, what pictures I used. I often bring pictures back to the people and give people pictures. You know, that's really a good way to, to build rapport is to bring them back pictures. Um, here's some pictures of your family. People love that. And actually, so many people in the Bronx, they still have my pictures in their family albums. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll talk to me. And they really try and show, you know, in rich neighborhoods, they have basketball courts. Well, here, um, you know, the fire escape becomes the basketball court. Um, just kids, um, you know, when you first go into a neighborhood, that's, I mean, he's kind of half smiling. Do I trust this guy? But then, you know, he's <laughs> giving me another message, too, you know. <laughs> So you sometimes get mixed um, messages. It's just the daily life. What's, what's going on? That's a toy gun, by the way. That was his kids. That was his son. That was his... Um... This was the first day. And sometimes you just got to take a chance. I was there, um, and this, this motorcycle gang was out in the street, and they said, do you want to get a great picture? Come into our headquarters. And I figure, well, either they're going to beat me up and uh, grab my camera and, or I'm going to get a great picture. But I realized that if I didn't go in, they actually would beat me up. So if I went in, at least they would trust me. No, if you, you know, you're out in someone else's turf and you show them you don't trust them, you know, they can get angry. So I went in, but they were really friendly. And, and the guy, this is his girlfriend, he says, here, take the picture. Um, 
again, you know, they were just teenagers. That's Pancho on the, on the left. You'll see another picture of him. But they're just teenagers doing what teenagers do all, all over the world. Um, that's Pancho with his girlfriend. And then that's, um, you know, Ouija. That's my Ouija picture. Ouija had a famous picture in the, for when I say nothing ever changes, you know, uh, there's pictures from the 50s. I think it's from the 50s, right? The Ouija picture. Maybe it's from the late 40s of a family out in a fire escape in New York. And here it's still going on. Um, some kids were living in an abandoned building. And these kids were resourceful. They actually went to the utility pole and pulled the electricity into the, into the apartment. And so they had electricity and everything in there. Um, drugs. Um, again, you know, guys selling drugs out in the street. Everyone's just hanging out. The gun someone stole from, and uh, actually, these kids, to, the, 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 some drug dealer took this, or his cousin took it from an army base. That was originally a U.S. Army gun. They smuggled it off an army base. Um, but then the kids stole it from this guy who was a drug dealer, but they ended up having to give it back. There's Pancho again on the right. And baseball, the all-American game. But in the Bronx, you know, you can make a statement about poverty and baseball and the whole thing all in, all in, in, in one, one picture. So we're, and there's Martin again. You know, so some pictures like this could have been taken any place. And that's what I like to do. I mean, if you're going to photograph a community, uh, you really, you know, you want, to, you, you want to show everything. And it's really important to try and get beyond stereotypes if you can. You know, and the media loves <laughs> stereotypes. But, you know, as photographers, especially in personal projects, the idea is to get behind it. Now, I'm just going to quickly show you some other projects. I did a project on multiracial. This is what Moravian College published. And these are multiracial Americans. I wanted to make a statement on race, but I didn't want to just do black and white, which is what most people do, because America is becoming a multiracial country. And I really wanted to just show this. And I thought, well, what could be a nicer way to visualize this. And what I actually did in the book is we actually put all their ethnicities as the caption. So some of the pictures will have like, you know, I think the most is somebody had 10 different ethnicities. You know, some people just had two. But it was, um, you know, ra as you all know, race is a myth. There's no such thing as race. I mean, race is not scientific at all. But ethnicity and culture is real. And so what I did is focused on, on culture and ethnicity and let people self-define. So some people said, you know, um, I'm American Indian, or some people would give their specific tribe, or some people, you know, some people would be very specific, and some people, uh, you know, would just say, uh, you know, I'm African. I think you all know who this guy is. <laughs> Doesn't he look young? That was when he was campaigning. <laughs> And you may know that, that golfer. It's Tiger Woods. That's Miss Universe. So I got some. This also became, as I got into it, I realized this became a, a, a U.S. history thing. So two descendants of presidents. Emily, who's back there, is the fifth great-great-granddaughter of President Thomas Jefferson and his slave, Sally Hemi. And then this little kid is a descendant of President Franklin Pierce. Sometimes you get into stereotypes. You know, Asians playing instruments is kind of a stereotype. And the guy got out the thing, and I asked him about it. And he said, I know it's a stereotype, but that's what I want to do. So that's fine. You know, sometimes, I mean, just because something's a stereotype doesn't mean it isn't true. You know, if, if someone's a high achiever and they like music, you, you know what I'm saying? So, I mean, there's a, um, um, it's just to be aware 
if it's a stereotype, but that doesn't mean you have to shy away from it. I don't need to be politically correct. What's important to me is that the people feel comfortable with the picture, and it's what the people want to do. And then sometimes you have to think. I mean, it was my idea when I talked to these people, they said they had a boat, and since they, their ancestors who came over on the Mayflower, I thought, well, can I go out in your boat and take a picture? And that's kind of a cliche, but it's a visual cliche, but whatever. And then this kid is a son of a Tibetan Lama. So it was just, you know, when I did this project in multiracial, I, when I started doing it, I also photographed someone who was a descendant of the Tuskegee Airmen. I mean, you find that, that multiracial goes way back, you know, to the founding of the country and this myth that we have that some people like uh, this, this real estate guy, um, you know, have that we had this kind of pure country and all these people are coming to pollute it. It's like, you know, maybe we should have stopped letting ancestors, you know, immigrants come when his grandparents wanted to come. <laughs> maybe, that, maybe, we, maybe, maybe we're too late. Um, you know, look at how beautiful she is. So I just wanted the pictures to just speak for themselves, to people to just see the beauty and not to really make a, a big statement. Then I did a project on, on five continents and ten different countries over, I, I started in 1994 and kind of finished in 2006. I wasn't working full time on it, but I would just keep going back to it. I'd go to a different country on street kids, street children all over the world. So this is in Brazil. That's in Romania, gypsy kids. Again, you see violence is really a theme in my, my work. That's in Bangladesh. There's some gypsy kids. So you have the violence, but then also how kids band together. Um, then I did a project, which I did for the Casey Foundation, um, on dads, low-income dads, and how important dads were to children's lives and to the community. And the, the back story of this is that America, um, in the, um, when Nixon was president, even before when Johnson was president, they started you know, welfare and all these programs for women. And they actually drove the men out of the families. And I remember the police would go raid. If a woman had a man in the house and she wasn't married to him, they would actually stop her welfare and they'd go try and arrest the guy. So the men left the house. So that if some government policy actually drove the men out of the house. And they, they were trying to be nice to women. That's why I'm saying when I say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. They had the good intent. Well, maybe they didn't have good intentions. Maybe they were just trying to placate blacks so they wouldn't be revolutionary and buy them off. If you're a cynic, that's what you believe. If you're a good liberal, you believe the government was trying to help poor people. You can make up your own mind depending on your politics. At any rate, they really left men out of the equation. And so finally, 20 or 30 years later, people are starting to realize, wait a second, boys are, really need their dads, especially. Girls need their dads too, but they realized that all these boys were growing up without these dads and all kinds of bad things were happening. They were shooting each other, all kinds of things. So, we did a project just looking at um, dads and programs that were helping dads in, in low-income um, communities. Um, these were some um, Hmong, H-M-O-N-G, from, from Cambodia. Um, and again, I'm always interested. I mean, here's the rock. They're eating, you know, they're, they're immigrants. Or they're, they're eating a hamburger. And I, th those sorts of things are really you know, always interesting to me, how we uh, Americanize everybody. This was a program for, um, you know, dads in, uh, I think this was Indianapolis. Um, and sometimes it leads to some. So I did an exhibit at Open Society on the dads project, and someone from the city saw it under, uh, who worked for the human resources under Bloomberg, and so they hired me to do an ad campaign which, which was in the subways. And you notice that's Pancho. Remember I told you Pancho helped me? Well, I, I still am in contact with him, so I put him in the ad. And then there's a, you know, they made bus boards and subway um, boards out of this. So sometimes your documentary project can lead to um, something else. And then the last picture, this is just a picture is from Brazil, some beautiful women, which is also okay. 
So that's that. I finished two minutes early. How was that? Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> We have time for Q&A. I'll pass around the mic if you want to ask a question. The mic is not going to make your voice louder, but it's necessary for us to record the video, so please use it. Yeah. And just remember, Donald Trump threw someone out who asked an embarrassing question. So just <laughs> That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your work. Um, I think you really eloquently spoke about how you gain and maintain access, but I'm curious as to how do you know when a project is over? Mm -hmm. hmm. It, that's, that's just very subjective. Um, you just, you know, um, I'll answer it this way. My, my wife's grandmother used to make this wonderful bulka, you know, it was like cinnamon, cinnamon bread. And, and um, so my wife, asked her, you know, how do you know, you know, you put in this, you put in this, how do you, you know, she, you know, how do you know how much cinnamon to put in? She says, when it's enough. That's how you know. <laughs> right? <laughs> how long do you, <laughs> so I guess my answer is the same. You know when, I mean, you just, sometimes you're just sick of it, sometimes when, when, when it's enough, when you've just kind of, Got it. Um, there's no real answer to that. I, I, you know, I can't give you an honest answer to that. You just gain experience. It's just like, I've got it. And part of it, the part that I will say is part of it depends on what you're doing. Obviously, if you're doing a book, it's going to take a lot more for it to be over than if you're doing a photo essay for a newspaper where they want 10 pictures. Well, so if they want 10 pictures, it, once you've got 30 good pictures, you're more than done. You know, if you're doing a book and you know you need 200 good pictures, well, then you need 500 good pictures before you're, you, you know what I'm saying? So, so part of the only answer I can give is part of it depends on what you're trying to do, what your intentions are. You know, are you doing a class project for your teacher or are, are, are you doing a book that's going to be the, you know, your magnum opus is, is that's going to make you famous as a photographer? So that's really the only thing. And then you just, you know, the second thing I'll say is have you told the story? You know, you look at your pictures. What's missing? What have I, what have I left out? I'm doing this story. Oh, my God, I don't have pictures of this. You know, that's really an important component. So it's really a subjective thing, but it depends on what your intentions are and then what the story is you're trying to tell. Do you have all the components? You know, think of it like a movie. If you were doing a movie, you know, a, an hour and a half movie, and it has to have three acts and, and 20 scenes in it, um, do I have all the transitions? Do I have all the scenes? Is there something missing? Is there a beginning? You know, most projects have a beginning, middle, and end. Not everyone does, but most projects are kind of structured that way. Um, so that's really the answer, is to look at it and is it finished? Is, is this really something I want to show other people? Am I proud of this? Are, are the pictures good enough? And, and really, um, I, I often show it to other people, too. It's really hard sometimes to judge your own work. It's really good to find some friends who can be honest with you and find a friend that's a close enough friend to tell you that picture stinks. You know, we were talking earlier before I started, you know, sometimes you'll spend a lot of effort. You'll climb to the top of a mountain and you'll spend two days taking a, preparing for a picture and you're really invested in it and someone else looks at it and goes, doesn't make it. And you're like, God, I gotta, you know, I worked so hard on that. Well, it doesn't matter. In the end, it's not, you know, in the end, it's someone else looking at the picture and do they get it? Does it communicate with other people? So, you know, show your project to some other people and that, don't let them judge it. You've got to be the judge of it. Because I've done, I've done projects that when I did it, the Bronx Project's a perfect example. When I did the pictures, they scared the hell out of people. And a lot of people, nobody would publish it. I mean, it took 20 years to get that published. No one would publish it. 
Even the, the heroin picture, I mean, I tried to get magazines to do something on drugs coming back. No one was interested. No one wanted to deal with it. And they finally dealt with it when drugs, you know, when drugs got into the suburbs. Then it became something they wanted to deal with, um, which is sad, but that's the media. Um, but then all of a sudden, for some reason, you know, 20 years later, um, the pictures, I guess, were less scary to people or they had seen a lot of movies or whatever, whatever. For whatever reason, people could deal with the pictures. So, you know, show the pictures to other people, but don't throw it away um, just because they say it's no good. I mean, I've, I'll, I'll just tell you one other quick anecdote. I, I did a story, you know, Mary Ellen Mark's really famous book. Well, actually, um, I did that story before she did. And, I, no, I did. And I, I, I started, I did a story on Times Square, and child prostitute in Times Square, and I showed it to Life Magazine. And the editor at Life Magazine said, okay, um, we can't do this story because it's all, I mean, he actually said this. I'm not going to tell you his name. He's a famous photographer. I'm not going to embarrass him with his name, but he was an editor at Life. He said, you know, they're all black and Puerto Rican kids, and nobody cares, and so our readers don't care. We're not going to do it do a story on white kids. So I was working at Parade Magazine at the time, so I actually went out to Seattle and discovered the story on these white kids in Seattle who were living on the street. So I came back to Life Magazine and said, okay, you want to do the story? I still want to include the other thing, but you want white kids, so let's put some white kids in too. Well, they didn't do the story, but the writer saw my notes. I mean, Marion L. Mark was a friend, and I actually talked to her about it, and she said she didn't actually know that, that the writer came up with the idea of the story. So the writer actually saw my notes, and the writer went to Life Magazine editor and did the story, and then they hired Mary Ellen Mark and sent her out to do the story, and they did that story. But the point I'm trying to make is that I gave up doing the story because the editor told me no one was interested. And that was a big mistake, because it turns out it actually was a good story. And I shouldn't have listened to the editor. So show your story to other people, but be your own judge of what, you know, if you think it's important, then just do it. That was a long answer to your question, but. How do you decide and pick a project or a topic? How do I decide what topic to do? Um, I just find things that interest me. Um, sometimes, um, um, you know, you start a project and then you find it takes you in another direction. But uh, um, I just, you know, read and listen to things, and when I see something that, that piques my interest, then I just investigate it further. I, I think the best thing to do is to just follow your interests. You'll do a better job if you do something that interests you. And also, when you're starting out, it's really good to do something that you really know. For instance, if you know horses, do a story about horses. Why? Because you might not be the best photographer, but you might be the best horse photographer because you know more about that topic than anybody else. So, but you know, the, the fact is it's really hard to do stories and it really takes a lot out of you. You know, I mean, I come back exhausted when I do stories and not just physically. I mean, people nowadays, because everyone has their little iPhones and they snap pictures and everyone thinks it's easy to take pictures and everyone thinks they're a photographer. You know, right? But it, it, to really take good pictures takes a lot out of you, physically, but also emotionally. You know, when you're photographing some of these things, you, you come back and it hits you. I mean, it's like, you know, you're, you're, you see things and, and it affects you. So th the point is, if you're doing something that's of interest to you, then you'll keep doing it. If you're just doing something because you think it's going to sell or because you think someone else wants to do it, you're not, going to be able to, you're not going to be able to keep it up. So really, the thing is to just read a lot, you know, keep your eyes open, 
go around, talk to people, and then just find something that interests you. And it doesn't matter what it is. You know, it can be a small little thing. Sally Mann got, the, you know her work? Do you all know Sally Mann? She photographed her family. It sounds stupid, right? What do you do? Oh, I photographed my family. Well, that's kind of dumb. Really? She did great work. You know, so uh, you can photograph your family. Photograph your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your husband, your wife, your children. A bunch of photographers have photographed their children, done great work. You know, other people travel halfway around the world. It doesn't really, it doesn't really matter. What really matters is that you get in there and you really do something with it. Do you know what I'm saying? The topic doesn't matter. What matters is what you bring to the topic. I mean, frankly, every topic in the world has been covered by somebody else. You're not going to find anything original in the world. It's all been covered. But it hasn't been done the way a great artist might do it. Right? Do you, you know what I'm saying? You know, it's like literature, you know, or movies. I mean, some people joke there's like three plots in movies. There's a love story. You know, there's the, the kind of action hero violence story. You know, I mean, there's only two or three kind of plots. Um, but it's the same with photography. There isn't anything in the world that hasn't been done before, either in a novel or a movie or another person, but that doesn't mean that you can't do it better. So that's really the idea. Hi, thank you for sharing your work. I, ha I had a question. You talked about intimate, well, you talked about spending time. Your images definitely show the intimacy. So I guess my question to you is, how do you deal, because you talked about emotions, how do you deal with your mental health in regards to being close, getting close to some of these subjects? You're dealing with human suffering and pain and then finding out, like the one success story, well, I don't, I, I'm sure there's a lot of success stories, but you have, like, Paco was a success story. But what about the ones that end up a little yeah, sketchy? Yeah, and in jail. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, and like in Bronx Boys, I mean, more than two-thirds of the kids that I photographed were dead or in jail. I mean, it was really, really a high percentage. You just, I mean, you deal with it the same way you deal with it in, in your own life. You just have to get over it. I mean, the good news is, you know, you get close to people, but they're not your mother and father. You, you know what I'm saying? You can get close to people, but humans are wired, you know, that your immediate family, it just resonates with you more than somebody else, even if they're a friend, right? So all I, all I can say is you're doing a story on somebody and something bad happens and you get, you're going to get upset. Um, and maybe you won't get as upset as you would if it was your own son, because that's just the way we're wired. We want to believe that everyone's equal, but your own mother and father affect you more than your best friend's mother and father. Do you know what I'm saying? So all I can say is obviously it's not as intense as if it's your own family. Um, but it's a lot more than obviously someone you don't know at all. I mean, they're people you get to know and you just get upset. I mean, that family that was fighting, that, where the woman was giving him the finger, I, I went home and I kind of got under the covers for two hours and just kind of curled up and just lay there and kind of got into a Zen state. I mean, sometimes you get over it and sometimes you don't. I mean, I know a lot of war photographers come back and they actually, you know, get, what is that, post-traumatic stress. I mean, photographers do suffer from that, and some people are more susceptible um, to it than others. So that's all, you know. I, I actually did a photo project on Holocaust survivors, you know, portraits, and we did, I was part of a project, and we did their stories. And what was amazing is that some people have a mechanism that they're ever able to let stuff go, and they're able to not dwell on it. And so I photographed some of these Holocaust survivors, and they were like so positive and so, I mean, it was amazing. And others were still living back in there. And I, I mean, I photographed Stephen Hawking, the scientist, 
who has that Lou Gehrig's disease. And he actually is an incredibly positive person. And he actually said to me, when, when we were there, he said, actually, it's kind of a good, uh, teachers aren't going to like this, but he said, it's actually a good thing that I have this because they let me do this research and I don't have to teach and deal with students and everything. So <laughs> he, he actually thought it was a positive, you know, he actually made, had made a positive out of what some people would have been depressed about. And so all I can say to you is all you, you have to figure out yourself how to, as all of us had to, how do you deal with trauma in your life? How do you deal with your parents dying? How do you deal with a brother or sister dying? How do you deal with your best friend dying? How do you deal with losing a job? How do you deal um, with, you know, flunking out of school? How do you deal, you know, any of the things, you know what I'm saying, any of the things that, that, that happen to people. And some people just, pick themselves up and go on and some people don't and I don't have uh, I'm not a Zen master I don't have an answer you know an easy answer to what you do but all I can say is it's the same with being a photographer um, you just have to try and figure out a way to just move on and not get you know not let it bog you down that's you know that's all I can I, I can can really say and that's something to do in life not just as a photographer but in your personal life too how you know how is it that some people are able to just pick themselves up and just keep going you know people like Martin who had so much trauma in his life and he just kept picking himself up and 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 going and one of, one of the just the last thing I'll say on that is one of the things sometimes is just have a goal and to focus on something bigger than yourself and and a bigger goal I mean, we ran a program. At one point, I, I started an NGO in Africa, and we put kids in school, um, AIDS orphans and, and former child soldiers. And one of the things we did is just got them to focus on their future, not to think about their past. And when they were able to do that, they, they really were able to really achieve a lot of things and get to the best schools and really make their life for themselves. And I think that's what Martin was able to do, is focus on a dream that he had rather than focus on how fucked up, excuse my language, on how fucked up his life was. And if you're a photographer, I think maybe you do the same thing. You focus on this project's really going to help a lot of people. Um, this is really going to be a positive thing. Um, I'm focusing on that, not... F anyway, that's, it sounds, I, I, I hope that doesn't sound too trite, but it, it's... All I, does that help or does that answer your question? Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. That was a great lecture. Thank you, everybody, for coming. And uh, see you in two weeks. <laughs> okay, thank you.